Okay, welcome everybody to the second iteration of point of entry, subjugated knowledges and situated experiences in our global institutions. And I must apologize again for this awful verbal title that somehow made a trick and probably be here tonight. So thank you for joining us and cheers to our abstruse jargon, I guess. Uh, I must begin as always thanking the Department of Comparative Literature at NYU for its support with the series, and specifically our Chair Max Sanders uh, and our wonderful events wizard, Michael Ernst. Thanks, Michael, once again for your guidance and your support at every step. <coughs> and then, of course, I have to thank a lot my dear friends and guests, Rosario Vidalgres and Fernando Mosqueda, Latin American curators working in two important institutions here in New York, the Drawing Center and the New Museum. I want to thank them for being here, for responding to our curiosity, and for work, walking with candor into this trap. I mean, this conversation, which is a trap, but only partially because they know me well. They have suffered already by night for a friendly attack, which is what they are going to endure elegantly today. <laughs> El dedo en la chaga, as Rosario told me a couple of days ago, which could translate as pouring salt on the wound. I'm sorry for that but also as hitting the nail on the head, which is a great thing. Provocation might be one of the sharpest tools of connected critical thinking for all I know. In any case, I have confirmed over the years that it helps set the stage for a dialogue that is honest, fruitful, and open like a wound. <laughs> which is one of the motivations behind this event to produce an encounter of the third kind between university serfs <clears throat> and art cultures, kindred kindred species that should confabulate more and more often. It has become obvious that museums are paid for research and for writing, that their exhibitions and catalogs, which acrobatically mobilize our own concepts and, and interrogations, should be read by the university, and that we, as scholars and also our students, have much to contribute to the museum and to the curatorial practice. Briefly, we comparatists and literary critics could be part of the transdisciplinary multi crew shaping the art institutions of the future. Now, <clears throat> and as we have all learned painfully while growing up in that old institution of torture, the family, propinquity doesn't preclude criticism. So you will excuse me if I gently throw you under the bus for a minute, my dear friends. After all, we have invited you to critically examine the museum as global institution and some of the curatorial practices within its confines. A brief captatio benevolentiae is due, though, not for me, but for my guest. It is not easy to be a Latin American curator. It is not easy to be a Latin American curator working at an institution in the US. <clears throat> There are historical reasons we are all aware of. The art produced in our cultures, which includes the art produced before European conquest, has been first destroyed, then desecrated, and later ransacked with the rest of our resources. It has been exoticized and transformed into an emblem of barbarism, of primitive beliefs and superstition, sometimes exhibited in the anthropology sections of museums, sometimes becoming the poster for so-called naive or irrational forms of expression. It has also suffered directly the perennial interventionism of US agencies, well known when it comes to political affairs. By way of example, different researchers have documented well the relentless effort by the Rockefeller Foundation after the scandal around the mural commission to Vigo Rivera to shift the focus of Latin American artistic practice to steer it away from explicit political content and into more formal and abstract terrains. Let's say, let's say we have left those times behind, as if we could let, leave them behind. Things have changed for sure, but this is part of the legacy the museum has to work with. And then there are other issues that have more recently been brought to our attention, brilliantly synthesized by activist group like Strike MoMA, groups that point to the ongoing engagement of global museums with forms of colonialism, extractivism, art washing, and the like. It's only a matter of taking a look at the names celebrated on their walls, at the list of patrons and financial contributors. In this respect, of course, our fellow curators are not very different from us. We are all working in hostile territories. 
So, of course, these are not issues I expect Rosario Bernardo to respond to, not as if they needed to be held accountable for in any case. All global institutions have been built upon past wrongdoings on a major scale, and they rest upon current injustices. We are all a minute away from a poltergeist type of a scenario, or pet cemetery, if you prefer. Pick your own horror story. Our institutional homes are surely haunted houses. Bernardo and Rosario are welcome to reflect on our shared ontological predicament, of course, but I wanted, I wanted to invite them, <coughs> sorry, to offer us the insights into a very specific issue, more connected to their practice and to the triumphs I've seen them accomplish. It'll be synthetic. The museum has two major polar opposite and complementary powers. I will call the first one the power of cultural amplification. This is undeniable that the museum has the capacity to amplify cultural resonance. This is to work as a platform where peripheral local cultural expressions, artistic initiatives, and artists can reach a larger global audience. This has been a consistent development in the last decades with more and more Latin American artists gaining international attention, acclaim, and recognition. And with them, of course, sometimes a whole local scene is illuminated, a whole series of situated experiences and subjugated knowledges get to circulate, making the global conversation more complex, more nuanced, truly global, a girl can dream. Now, the title of this series points to the downside of this power, because there is undeniably the price of entry to these institutions. And then among those who are able and willing to pay, that price might mean a series of negotiations, adaptations, and transformations. Also, I'm getting closer to our point tonight, a complicated process of translation. Let me try to explain myself briefly. <clears throat> In many art shows that feature Latin American artists, the art seems to be granted entry on the condition that it is understandable, that the audience will get a clear message. The task of the curator then approaches very obviously the practice of translation from Spanish, Portuguese, or French into English, of course, but also from the very personal and sometimes enigmatic idiom of the artist into what has become the shared language of global institutions a lingua non franca that in most cases has renounced any aspiration to poetry and that has to show its commitment to a very diffuse sense of criticality. For instance, in order to secure meaning and legibility, art pieces are presented to illustrate some very general political thesis. This artist denounces the advent of the Anthropocene. This other artist questions gender binarism. What we get then is not the inexhaustible treasure of art, but a platform for the circulation of information. We go to an exhibition to learn that the artist comes from X, that they have suffered Y, that he discusses C, and that she proposes A. The artist is that reduced at best to a proponent of ideas of or things, and at worst, as a representative of their conditions of existence, of their social biographical experience. In both cases, art is reduced to illustration, to a manifestation of what was always already there, that is, to tautology. In this type of translation, which is unfortunately very common, we are close to unleashing the second power museums have, and that I will call, with a dash of drama, the power of deactivation. We have all experienced this, the museum, the clinical space of the museum, with its constant flow of visitors, its corporate spatial design, its operation group lightning, this critical apparatus in overdrive, making sure we understand everything and we reduce the world to what it purportedly expresses. It is like an inverted wish award designed to wrench art of all its magic, of every trace of mystery. I may be treading into very subjective waters here, although I know it is a shared feeling. It has become more and more rare to be moved by an exhibition, to visit an exhibition and have a truly transformative aesthetic experience. I'm not saying anything new. In fact, presenting a museum as a life sucking chamber has been a staple of all forms of the avant garde since the beginning of the 20th century. A very personal favorite in this lineage is a video clip Michel Gondry created in 1995 to promote, to promote sorry, Bjork's Army of Me. I don't know if you remember that video. If you remember it, towards the end of the video clip, 
Bilor plants a bomb in a museum to save his boyfriend, who is exhibited asleep on top of a marble bed. The not to Snow White authorizes a brutal allegorical reading. In this particular extreme pop take, the price of entry to the global institution seems to be death. The museum has frozen a life form in order to exhibit it. Conversely, in order to transform this still life into moving life, Bjork had to destroy the museum. This form of terrorism was already suggested very emphatically by the futurist and other avant-garde movements, as we all know. They proposed very physical attacks against the museum because they regarded it as a mausoleum for undead forms of expression uprooted from the territories and the communities that, got, that gave them life and meaning, but also as a prison that wouldn't let us circulate freely to become part of life. They wanted to make sure that art would break free from the museum to become life itself, and of course, one of its most vibrant transformative forces. It is in the sense that Walter Benjamin described the task of surrealism as that of winning the energies of intoxication for the revolution. This is the same Benjamin that championed a complex and counterintuitive theory of translation, a theory of translation that does not believe in transparency and that does not give first rank to the project of rendering foreign texts legible or understandable. This is exactly the esoteric attitude I believe the art world is desperately lacking. And that my two great guests here have observed with their work against all odds and pressures. Inviting to New York fantastic and complex artists like Fernanda Laguna, Cassiel Vitorino Brasileiro, or Daniel Lee, to name a few, Rosario and Bernardo have somehow managed to strike the right balance between accessibility and rigor, which is why I invited them tonight. Not to theorize on the ability of the curator to behave like a good translator or a noble traitor, but to show us how they work, keeping at bay that dangerous fantasy. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, Mariano, uh, thank you for having us here today and for your candid introduction. Uh, Actually, the theme of this conversation is something that, of course, is very much present in uh, the work that I do uh, working at the Drawing Center, and I'm excited to share my perspective and experiences with you today. Uh, and I guess not as a matter of like preemptive, like apologetic uh, intro introduction, but I did wanted to give a little bit of context first of where I work um, to kind of like set the discussion. Uh, so I'm a curator at the Drawing Center, which is an exhibition space in Soho that explores the medium of drawing through contemporary and historic exhibitions. Um, so we were founded in 1977, um, and our goal or what we do is really to like present exhibitions of masterful drawings that define both drawing and mastery in the broadest sense of both terms for over 25 years. So our shows range from a, an overview of shaker gifts to shows by artists who range from great modernists like Eva Hesse to Qigong practitioners from Northwest China, redefining graphic virtuosity and blowing wide open uh, the parameters of conventional connoisseurship. And I think that this is um, an important distinction to make, like vis a vis, for instance, like the sort of like legacy of the kind of like enlightened, like the enlightenment legacy of the medium to account for the work creativity and in a way it's been productive or generative to me um, because we're working within this kind of like drawing parameter and and drawing happens to kind of be a medium that uh, inherently is incredibly democratic and accessible and popular and kind of like legible to people beyond a kind of 
uh, kind of like contemporary art discourse. And so I think that that kind of gives us more liberty to kind of like move more fluidly between what we would call known and unknown. Um, and this is like really at, at the heart of, of, of what we do. Um, but I would like to add to what Mariano contends uh, as an increasing inclusion of different kinds of native informants, and I'm quoting you as a de rigueur strategy by institutions aspiring to be unproblematically critical, this is Mariano's words, is when a contemporary art discourse is seen as a larger shift seen in museums and biennials, as well as in art schools and magazines, towards the recognition of heterogeneous global modernism, so a need to really expand the art historical canon as we know it. Um, for better or worse, I think that the real watershed uh, moment of this shift was the expansion uh, and reopening of the Museum of Modern Arts in 2019 with an actualization and approach of their mission to a new narrative of modern arts taking place to more diverse and more global art histories. So as of 2019, one third of MoMA's galleries are reconceptualized every six months, featuring new acquisitions that try to diversify and globalize the museum's Euro-American core. MoMA's efforts, however, have been criticized as not necessarily, and I'm quoting um, here, Jean Wang, who's an incredible art historian and curator, says a, a progressive move towards more inclusive and nuanced narratives of modern and postmodern art worldwide, but rather as a form of institutional gaslighting that raises different speaker issues and the more manifest ills of exclusion and erasure. Uh, and I think that the culmination of this present moment is the latest edition of Documenta, the most prestigious global art exhibition, which happens every five years for 100 days in the city of Kassel in Germany. Originally staged in 1955 in post war Germany, Documenta was created to signify to the world Germanist reopening to cultural internationalism. And this year's edition was the first time that a, not only an artistic collective, a collective, but from the global south, was invited to organize it. The Jakarta based artistic collective Ruang Grupa blew up the collective decision making process into a larger paradigm which they call Lugung, meaning rice barn in Indonesian, and consisted in, it consisted in inviting almost 20 art collectives and allowing those collectives to invite their own participants. Uh, Documenta 15 was not a show about individual artworks or grand ideas, but a show about methodologies and cunning strategies, the ones that we're talking about. A show that brought to the very heart of international artistic discourse a viewpoint from the global south and a way of life, of living, breathing, eating, sharing as art. As exemplified in the New York Times' blazing indictment by critic Jason Farago, who proclaimed that it was so misguided and indifferent to art of any quality that it will kill the 67-year-old documenta for good, illuminates contemporary artistic discourse, poverty of imagination, the current state of criticism, but also the very real impact that documenta have already had and why the conversation we're having today is so significant. There's pushback really at both ends of the fall. <laughs> uh, reflecting on this uh, condition uh, where, where institutions are increasingly recognizing modernisms as more diverse and global illustrates that as in as much as the historical framings, and I'm quoting um, Jing again, remains uncontested and situated knowledge, knowledges are routinely overlooked uh, the promise of pro progressive inclusivity can fall short. Presenting these alternative trajectories using the criteria and assumptions of the old canon, essentially treating them as outposts of Western art history, will always miss the mark, limiting the discourse while purporting to expand it. Um, and so I thought that this was, uh, I guess, like really helpful for me in, in kind of like. Um, situating the conversation, because I think uh, for me, the question that we're talking about or that I'm interested in discussing is really a question about framing and positioning. It is a question about what kind of criteria, what critical frameworks, as well as what kind of gaze uh, is adopted when looking at uh, and presenting this alternative peripheral narratives. And I think, um, 
So rather than throwing away the baby with the bathwater, I would like to make a case for curating and control practices that embody, that embody and, and, and acknowledge one key concept for today's talk, which is what Donna Haraway calls situated knowledges, as a vibrant notion for thinking with essentially a quote, rethinking of how critical inquiries into new subjects and artistic practice are framed. So Haraway talks about situated knowledge as requiring that, quote, the object of knowledge be pictured as after an agent, not a screen and resource, never finally a slave to the master that quotes it off, is that an ethic in his unique agency and his authorship of objective knowledge. Um, so I guess that this uh, notion was helpful in reflect, reflecting uh, on the exhibition of Argentine visual artist, writer, cultural agitator, and activist, Fernanda Laguna, that I organized at the Drawing Center and that was held between March and May of this year. Um, and some of, yeah, some of these ideas that kept coming about in relationship to Haraway, um, who talks about a view from a body, which is always complex, contradictory, structuring, a structured body versus a view from above, from nowhere, or from simplicity, about the folk sciences and voices of interpretation, translation, stutter, stuttering, and the partly understood, I know translation is always being interpretive, critical, and partial. Um, so uh, from the start of her career in the mid-1980s, uh, mid-1990s, Fernanda Laguna has started her own artistic path, making artworks with a unique visual style and through a feminist lens. Um, the exhibition, uh, which featured almost 60 works that spanned uh, three decades, was the first major survey to focus on what I call Fernanda's uh, expansive drawing practice. Um, and it highlighted the role of drawing uh, in an over that includes Fernanda's work as a visual artist and also as a writer, a curator, an activist, and a cultural agitator. Um, so even though Fernanda is the ultimate um, multidisciplinary artist, uh, her practice found a place at an institution dedicated to drawing Precisely in viewing all of this, like disparate elements of her work as connected through her use of the substrate of paper. Um, but also given her unique employment of drawing and its unmediated quality, which highlights like some kind of like uh, primary uh, attributes of drawing as its intimate, intimate nature, its ephemer ephemerality, and most importantly, its accessibility. Uh, like, um, so that's sort of like the kind of <laughs> the framing. Um, and the second thing I wanted to, uh, sorry, say is that, uh, so here we have an artist who works in a profoundly local sphere, um, whose practice as an artist emerged in response to the second wave of neoliberalism in Argentina, and the local emergence of queer politics, um, whose work subject in all its form is about, um, and I'm quoting here Cecilia Palmeiro, who wrote an incredible essay for the catalog, the radical possibilities that comes from poverty. Um, but Fernanda's desire to work in a profoundly local sphere does not diminish the importance of sharing her work with a broader audience outside of Buenos Aires and Argentina. Her work maintained, or at least I hope it did, its potency, despite being removed from the specific context for which it has been originally produced. One of the reasons for this, we argued, is because of social, cultural, political, and economic inequities are not unique to Argentina, and certainly because her work embodies and expresses things that are part of the universal experience, like sadness, love, longing, and friendship. Um, but Laguna first gained attention with a series of mid 1990s solo exhibitions, which featured her replicas of vintage illustrations for children. Portraits of pop stars depicted as close friends, surreal landscapes, and text based drawings of positive affirmations. And she went on to build an energetic career that includes visual art, uh, writing, curating, independent publishing, uh, and a sustained social practice. Uh, as a visual artist, she defined an aesthetic of the periphery, creating artworks that often incorporated inexpensive or discarded materials with a deliberately naive feminine. And popular sense of beauty. Um, 
together this symbols deploy uh her, her work uh form a visual lexicon that Laguna deploys for her work to express any virtual emotions and experiences and to forge emotional bonds for reviewers. And then in the 2000s, uh, Laguna's previously discrete writing practice began, began to intersect with her art practice, resulting in the more pronounced uh, use of raw visceral language in her drawings and changing materiality, including the incorporation of found materials like toilet paper, stickers, bottle caps, and tree branches, and overall artwork that are intentionally created and roughly executed by the same time profoundly emotional. Um, so a bit about the like the structuring of, of, of the exhibition, which was loosely hung chronologically, grouping works based on the year of creation, as well as shared themes and methodologies. Um, in the process of organizing the exhibition, it was important. Um, and I think, Mariana, in reference to what you're saying, to kind of really try to contextualize the work on its own terms, adopting the, la the critical framework or, or lack of one as a critical framework that the artist has used. And this meant, of course, initially situating Fernanda's work in relation to the Generación of the Rojas and her artistic relationship with artist and critic Jorge Mayer, who between 1989 and 1996 run the Rojas Gallery, which was uh, an exhibition space that could turn into a space for queer and feminist art, challenging increasing professionalization of the field. Um, another element in engaging with the work on its own terms involved like unpacking and thinking through uh, Laguna's critical reception in Argentina, like this sort of like lack of consensus around it as well as a perception that everything she does is a result of coincidence or chance, which is ultimately something that is also constructed by the artist, but Fernanda calls uh, her heart's opportunism, um, and also a little bit sinister um, on behalf of Fernanda and the conversation that she had with Chris Krauss uh, in Publishing the Catalog just lights into this. Um, so my argument here was that in situa situating her practice at this degree zero of art grants her a unique position from where to experiment with art, arts possibilities on her own terms. Um, and there's this great quote, which some artistic project or the lack of one as an antidote to the, to the idea of an artistic project better than for not, um, yeah, that, 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 that's, uh, this artistic project by Fernanda, which says, and I'm quoting her, I'm not interested in being accepted by the art world. I'm not even interested in having my work last forever. I want to meet people who love me as I am, people who know me, who will send me an emoji heart on Instagram. Uh, so throughout the exhibition, it was important to, to kind of like really make sense of the work in the terms of the work and through and with Fernanda. Um, and uh, so then since the turn of the century, Laguna has initiated projects that have provided opportunities for collective artistic expression and production, including the white influential Vision de Felicidad, which translates as uh, beauty and happiness, and our gallery DIY publishing space and art supply store that was a meeting ground for Buenos Aires' uh, women and queer artists and writers. Collective initiatives like Vision de Felicidad were highlighted uh, in the in the, at the Drug Center's old level gallery, where, where Laguna installed herself a site specific archive of hand drawn murals, ephemera, videos, photos, and objects that chronicled um, her collective practice and activism, activism, including the Living Activist Archive High on the Tide, Diary of the Feminist Revolution by Fernanda, and activist and scholar Cecilia Palmeiro, that featured a playful arrangement of slogans, images, and aesthetic political artifacts that are meaningful and to uh, both Fernanda Cecilia's experience, um, as well as a documentation of, uh, of, of, of images that another friend of Fernanda called Cecilia uh, Sankovic took during the years that Fernanda, that that Virginia Felicida uh, was active, during the years that Virginia Felicida um, was active. Um, and the last element, uh, so, okay, so one more thought about this was that Fernanda herself, like, she's a curator, she's run spaces throughout her entire career, um, 
And so it was really important to kind of have her also be present in the way that she installs her work, which is like so different to to the kind of like the kind of like chronological art historical organization of, 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 of an exhibition. And it was important for me because that's kind of Fernanda always says that um yeah that her works are even almost always like not even thought like necessarily to like be shown anywhere. And, and the kind of like the idea of like the kind of like the domestic or kind of like shabby context where she uh presents her works um is important. So in a way that was a way to kind of like bring a part of, of that spirit uh into the exhibition. Um and and the last element involved in making uh, the first English language publication devoted to uh, her radical and pioneering work, um, which I edited and that featured a revealing interview with the artist by writer um, critic Chris, Chris Krauss and scholarship by, um, by, by scholar and activist Cecilia Palmeiro, um, who I invited her specifically to write about um, her kind of collective spatial initiatives from, like, I guess, more of like a critical clear theory perspective and it was like very like theoretical in a way uh, and by Nicola Guagnini who wrote about a specific letter that Fernanda wrote as a response for an invitation to participate in the show at the American Society as well as the letter so like Fernanda's own writing um, and her poems uh, trans translated so yeah I think that with that um, I'm going to end my presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, thank you, Mariana. Uh, thank you for listening. So, well, I'm Bernard Moshira. I'm the Executive Director of Hell of Academy Museum. This really so strange when it's called. <laughs> I just know this from this perspective. Um, and, and I'm also the Artistic Director of Palazzo Bakushi in New Jersey. Um, thank you so much, Mariana, for the invitation to be here in conversation with you and my dear Rosario, uh, two colleagues I respect and admire very much. I'm very excited to be, uh, I'm very excited for this conversation, both because it's so close to my research and practice, but also because it's a subject that is every day more important. Um, today, this conversation um, is called Point of Entry to the Curator as Translator, and it's part of a larger series Called subjugated analogies and situated, situated experiences in, the, in our global institutions. It's a fantastic program, Mariana. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I congratulate you for that. I'm very honored and excited to be part of this discussion. I'll just mark two little details in the title of this program and I'll try to come back to them uh, later. Maybe, maybe I'll forget which are the facts that we are using our global um we can think a little bit about our who and global what or how later um this is a conversation about the idea of translation in relation to curatorial practice but i might say in advance uh, that i'll ask um, more questions and present more paradoxes and generative contradictions than actually offer precise answers uh, or definitions. This approximation between curating and translating is particularly uh, particularly dangerous, uh, and because of that, also particularly interesting and important to be uh, discussed. Uh, to start this conversation, I'll make a brief theoretical introduction about the idea of knowledge for the Western epistemological system and a certain kind of subjectivity that comes um, with it. Then I'll um, speak briefly about the relationship between cultural institutions, austerity, and the maintenance of world forms. Then um, to then speak more directly about the obsessive use of categories um, in, the, in the West. 
in the ethical conception and very practical challenges of working with subjugated knowledge and marginalized people in the so-called global institutions. Um, maybe I'll bring two examples or three at the end, um, if we have time for that, um, of exhibitions that I've um, recently created here in New York and in Brazil. And at the end, I'll close maybe with a fragment of our, of our video, but I don't know if we're going to have time for that again. Um, well, if we're talking, about, first of all, here are some questions to have in mind while we are developing this conversation about translation. Um, it's important to ask who is translating, who is being translated, translating to who, with what purpose, what does this translation actually produces, actually produce in terms of processes and results? Is this actually translatable? And with that in mind, I'd like to ask what could be this curator as a translator, and how could we imagine? A curator as a subversive um, or insubordinate translator. Well, the the Western ontological system, or they think they can know everything. Mm -hmm. A crucial moment for the formation of what is called the European Western rationalism was the passage of the first century BC for the, 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 the first century AC for different reasons. But the one that I want to talk about quickly here is the work of Lucretius. The most important intellectual discipline of Epicurus. In his poem, De Vero Natura, he stated that the cosmos, the entire existence, is ruled by natural universal treatise that can be uh, that can be known, that can be accessed by humans' unique natural power, reason. Affirming that the gods live in a separate, separate realm, the philosopher excluded the possibility of divine intervention or causality, creating the idea that everything that happens can be explained by analyzing rationally the physical properties of the world. Lucretius described and created a hierarchy between two uh, categories, reason and what he calls old superstitions. Lucretius is saying that everything that exists can be rationally explained and everything that is not rationally explainable doesn't exist um, or doesn't matter anything. Uh, notably, Lucretius defines reason as a way to avoid the fear of death, uh, the fear of the gods, and the fear of the unknown. I'm fascinated by his work, truly, but I wonder how could be an ontological system, rational system, that is not based on the fear of the death, of the death of the gods, and of the unknown. Lucretius' ideas would be radicalized many centuries later by Descartes, of course, and his attempt to know with certainty and avoid contradictions, and later by Immanuel Kant, according to whom what is known with certainty, um, if you use the, uh, the categories properly, is a truth valid for everyone, universally. With almost 18 centuries separating the work of Lucretius and Kant, um, Kant repeats the same categorical distinction between reason as the only form of accessing um, a valid, verifiable truth, the universal truths, and the old superstitions, the same words used by Lucretius. I'm mentioning this here uh, because this binary distinction between a soul supreme form um, and a su supreme and universal form of reason and the old superstitions would be one of the most influential ever. Uh, it says that some people, European men and their and their descendants, are capable of explaining everything and other uh, everything and other people those were not European men and their descendants only know their old superstitions um, however we all know here that European rationalism is not the only valid way of knowing things uh, in fact it's a very limited form of knowing things it's literally bringing bringing us to the end of the world um, but but this category old superstitions would be extensively used in the process of colonization to invisibilize, humiliate, violate, and annihilate other forms of knowing and living, other ontopsymological systems, notably those of subjugated people. And in this missionary project of making Western rationalism the only existing form of knowing on the planet, the use of institutions was crucial. Of course, the state violence um, was central for punishment, control, etc. Uh, but um, but the schools, the academy, the cultural institutions were also fundamental for that. As, as we know, the colonial project is perverse, and so are the colonial institutions. 
in colonial times, um, as today, in another way, um, at the same time, they were giving ideological support for the annihilation of other forms of living. They were including elements of these engendered cultures in their institutions, in their academic disciplines, in their museum collections, etc. Uh, that was the dawn, of course, of that ethnography, anthropology, a time marked by the obsession with defining the others, and not unrelatedly, a time that was also obsessed with translation. Um, as we know, these modern colonial institutions were creating, conceptualizing, or structuring the social categories of gender, race, uh, sexuality, geographic origin, etc., while they were also creating the categories of primitive art, of folk art, of uh, popular culture, etc. They are not unrelated. European men and their, and their descendants who were leading these colonial modern institutions were using their reason to measure and define everyone else, using their nature, as said uh, Lucretius. The role reserved for everyone else on the planet was to explain their old superstitions uh, to this European man. Uh, in terms of geop geopolitics, that's how the colonial world defined the global dynamics around knowledge. People from the South explain the South to people from the North, and people from the North use this, this, uh, this information to explain the entire world for everyone, universally. Uh, this scheme, which obviously um, concentrates power in the hands of people from the North, people from, from, uh, from the North, is it still part of the infrastructure of the global art system. So one of the dangers of conceiving curators as translators for subjugated knowledges in the global institutions is precisely taking the risk of being this native informant figure that obviously helps to maintain the current unfair global power structures of our field. And uh, we all know translating is dealing with another language, is dealing with other categories and their meanings. And as we know, uh, as always in dispute, in negotiation, until a certain extent. And believe me, I'm not against translation. Um, I live in, in translation. Uh, I embody translation. There's nothing I believe more than the communication uh, between different people in groups. But what happens in those cases is that translation happens in a way that is not offensive to the hegemonic power. Any kind of threat is left out. Uh, some things are reason, some things are old superstitions, some things are art, some things are primitive art, some things are culture, some things are popular culture, or in other cases, um, and remember that they cannot deal so well with contradictions or with the fact that they cannot know some things, they will use their own categories to define things that they don't know anything about. For example, a big museum here in New York City, and I will, I won't, I will not say which museum is that, um, launched a, a fellow uh, position to research the relationship between abstraction and spirituality in Latin America, talking about the work of indigenous, indigenous artists. It's not abstraction here. You, it's, it's literally writing, figuration, life, things we don't have words for them in English. Um, it's just that you don't know how to read it. And even if they get some uh, someone to translate what they don't know, uh, they're going to say, cool, old superstitions. That's only valid for them at their other side of the absolute uh, line. Here we have Hodko, here we have Paul, reason, you know, valid for everyone. So what I want to, um, what, I would, uh, what I will try to envision here with you uh, is how can curators be insubordinate, subversive, disobedient, insurgent, conspiring, indisciplinary translators. Translators that do not serve to maintain the central power, but on the contrary, uh, to distribute power in the direction out of the center. Uh, curators are essentially agents of negotiation. We are always dealing with tons of agents and departments while we have to deal with artists, institutions, and audiences. Uh, if we're talking about negotiation, we are talking about politics. If it's politics, we need to talk about ethics and responsibilities. 
And if we're talking about translating subjugated knowledge or marginalized artists, we need to talk about our ethics and responsibilities with them. How not to violate their work, their power, their strength, um, neither defining them in the wrong way, nor by giving, uh, and also uh, at the same time, avoiding to give everything for the hegemonic power. Um, as I told you before, I don't have answers for that, <laughs> but I can share my personal strategies um, in relation to it. For me, um, I like to play with categories and how they control the place of things in the world. I like to take the lines of the greed of the ordered world, mundo ordenado, and make knots, holes, sculptures, ghosts, something else, anything else. So if I'm going to translate, I'm going to do my best not to use their their um, not to use their categories. Or if I use their categories, it's to appro appropriate them and give other meanings and to do whatever is good for my artists, for my people, and more. Uh, if they want to know everything about it, I won't say. I will tell, I will tell them just what we want them to know. We're going to complicate their categories. We're going to contaminate them, impregnate them, transform the relations that define their world. Um, and I'll just add a quick uh, note before I go to um, some a few uh, examples. Um, we are we are talking here a lot about institutions, but I also think it's so important to think about outside institutions or outside the museums. How can can we avoid those institutions that already exist and their means and create our own create our own way of working together? Um, I know I think it was Mariano who, who mentioned uh, Benjamin, right? You mentioned Benjamin. Um, Benjamin has this this tag that is fantastic, the, the, the critical violence, in which he's talking about like political action um, in response to Max Weber. And he says something that we have to, in my own words, that we have to imagine ways of, of developing political action outside of the means of the state. Because if we put our, our, our minds and our uh, fight only inside of the institutions that already exist, it limits our political imagination. Uh, and he, he talked about a, a, a politics of pure means um, in the in this same um, logic. Sometimes I think about that, like we're going to be here like fighting for a moment to decolonize, you know, like if you we decolonize more, there's nothing left. Um, so there's there's more things for us to do than, than, spend, than, than spend time uh, um, giving our power and, 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 and strength to transform an institution that will never support us. Let's just figure out other ways of working together, developing our institutions, uh, you know? So that's that's why I'm at, at, at the same time. That's my moment, so laugh about the and not the resume necessarily. So let's go. So I just brought three examples of uh, artists that play themselves with the idea of categories uh, and, and shows in which I also played with those, those, those categories. This is me in Asia Sioux, which was an artist uh, born in a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, city, very deep inside Brazil. And she her work was categorized as uh, primitive art and folk art. And because of that, all the texts um, that describe the work talk about how simple, uh, intuitive, and sweet and um, intuitive her work uh, is, and that's a that's a show I did with with her work in the modern um, art, um, the National Museum in, in Brasilia. She was completely forgotten for uh, decades because you know um, folk artists are not like part of the canon, um, and. A few years uh, ago, I was researching her work, and I was looking at some of the of her paintings, and I was like, "Wait, that's not really what I'm seeing here. Like, I'm not seeing like the work of a uh, simple, sweet um, <laughs> lady, because every um, painting that she developed has something weird, like in the scenes of weddings. She painted so many weddings, but like you see that." 
the 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 teenage the, the teenager uh, altar boy is looking to uh, the groom or the bride is touching um, very discreetly the the shoulder of um, another person in the wedding. And, and there you go. And I was like, this is not a sweet uh, um, innocent lady. So I started to research her work, and I discovered that she was a badass transgressive woman that was walking only with like fags and and uh Travis cheese like us uh, all together and she was like always wearing a lot of makeup and amazing clothes uh she was literally the assistant of uh Eva Seth who was like one of the great fathers of um like um, all this generation of uh, group of French like Eric Citri Jotar Creole came from Eva Seth. So like how uh, how the use of this very simple category made generations and generations of critics um, completely blinding in, in relation to, to her work. And then um, I managed to, to, to find her, her daughter um, and her daughter had an incredibly insane amount of works by her and works since the 50s. And I discovered those, uh, this group of, of painting her paintings um, that she developed in the in the in the fifties before she moved to um, to Rio, and that changed completely the meaning of every single of the wedding scenes that she painted. She painted herself in the days before she was uh, about to get married, and she was getting married to run away to um, to Rio and run away from her family. But she paints herself in front of this mirror. In the mirror, she sees this shadowy like devilish figure and what and that formally there's something very interesting for me there which is i think she's painting a crossroads um i see two openings two passages in the painting the first one is the mirror in which her in which she sees herself as a bride and the other one uh we have the passage of the corridor in which we see the door of the street so she sees like I get married or I will run away from you. Um, and that changed completely the meaning of every single one of the, of the wedding of, uh, images of this very candid woman. So we uh, made this show called The, uh, the Extraordinary Impurities of uh, Meeting Asia Silva. Some of the images are those that you're seeing here. Um, that's how that's the, one of the examples of how, how breaking uh with with uh, categories or ignoring cer certain categories can make us see uh further uh the other example that Ma that Maria mentioned mentioned here is Kashov Turin Brazil uh a genius uh for me one of the most interesting artists alive really she's incredibly radical um an artist that was also born in us yeah not so small but in a very uh, peripheral uh, city in Brazil, Vitória, uh, specifically in a community that used to be um, Quilombo, like a maroon. Uh, she, uh, in her own work as a psychologist, as an artist, and as a writer, a theorist, she plays with characters all the time. So she says things like, um, how can I how can I have a very dark a very black skin and refuse to be part of the black race? Or don't call me trans. I'm not transitioning to anything. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. I'm not trans. Don't call me queer. Um, and I am the the travesty transmutation. So she uses in her in her work a, a enormous amount of um, conceptual uh, discursive. Um, arrangements in which she refuses to be categorized or defined by anyone else uh, in this translation of her work and in the politics that she creates around her work and i had the the challenge to make a show with her that has a museum you know say new york as you said bart uh, uh, refusing to categorize her or her work which was as you might imagine incredibly challenging um, her work, her work was called Eclipse. It was uh, an installation, or how she calls actually, a uh, perishable space of freedom. So again, she's refusing the words and categories that art can give to things, and she's like, it's not an installation. You, you have to see, you, know, you cannot say installation, you have to say perishable space of freedom. Uh, and she's making these, like, institutions work around her. It's fascinating. 
um, when I presented this, this, this work there, the first reaction I had from a fantastic uh, German uh, black scholar who was working there, uh, who I respect very much, was like, this is like spiritual, she's creating like a spiritual thing, I don't think it's the place for that. So how can we define uh, what is in the right place or not? When, when she said that, I was like, perfect. If people are thinking that it's not the right place for that, that's when we're going to create the contradictions and make them deal with that. Um, and it was a space for um, healing and um, yeah, attunement in, in a way in the space. And she also uh, is very clear about, I'm not going to tell you how this is healing. I'm not going to tell you the spiritual fundamentals that put this, this place together. But it is, but it is what it is. And well, every other week I would find people crying there, meditating there. So it, something was happening. And and when I pre we presented this this video that was um, 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 commissioned by CCS in, in Isla, uh, the first reaction I had from the same the same person was that she was exoticized in the black body. Um, like her as a as a black travesti from a maroon in Vitória do Espírito Santo, her way of leaving her body was as much as in the black body. How obsessed with care words is that? And and a, a last um, example, uh, also artists that are playing with 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 care words and creating contradictions. Barbara Wagner imagine the book. Uh, she she's uh, Brazilian. He's uh, German. They have been working together for 10 years. We uh, created a curator show called Five Times Brazil uh, together with Margaret Norton at the New Museum last season. Uh, and we decided to put together the five works that they developed in, in Brazil in the past 10 years. Um, and using this title, Five Times Brazil, precisely, um, how did you call your, your thing? Um, a trap? No. Your, 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 your title that was a um, my title. Your title, anyways. It's like um, it's like a little a little a little trap. People go there thinking that they're gonna like yeah. understand Brazil, and then they they get there and they're like more confused than they were before. Um, so that was like precisely our um, bait. The bait, yeah, probably. Uh, it was something like that. It was like people are gonna come here to think that they're gonna that we're gonna explain Brazil to them. And then they're gonna get here and then they're gonna be like, how can this place exist with so many people that do not fit into each other? Um, and they do that in their personal works. Uh, they they have been working with different uh, cultural groups and collectives um, that produce culture like dance groups or kind of groups or etc. And they create these very complex collective processes in which all the voices are heard and intertwined in this uh, crazy cinema process in which everybody works in the, in the script, everybody works in the settings, everybody works in the edition, and etc. And then at the, at the end, things feels like they're not fitting completely well, even it's like a fantastic like, cin uh, cinema experience. And these contradictions, they come from the fact that, that they are considering many voices. And when you uh, watch their, uh, their films about Prevo dance or about gospel music or about um, that's, you cannot fully understand what it is, even if you're completely um, captivated by it. And that's not how they um, they really um, see their, their roles. Uh, um, at the same time, researching specific uh, groups, <laughs> like cultural groups, but refusing this uh, ethnographic or the Polish for this. Um, and I think that's that's pretty. Oh, I just have some images of the works that they they showed there. This is um, um, Father Pen, who was of the land that they worked with the um, the Landless Workers Movement, and this is Pashkivai, um, missionary collaborator with Prabhu Um and that's pretty much it. Well. <clears throat> Thanks to both of you. It was really wonderful engaging presentations. Actually, I mean, we had discussed like maybe six minutes each, whatever, and then like until that we both like the microphone, which I knew, of course, before.
Uh, no, well, thanks a lot. This was really comprehensive and kind of responding to some of our ideas. And I also love that uh, while we were preparing for this, I got messages from both of them, kind of anticipating that they were going to resist my my title or the idea of translator or translator, the subjugated knowledges. There were different things that we're not sure about, uh, which I think this is precisely what I was saying before. I'm impressed by the work because. Uh, I mean, he was now declaiming this idea of insubordinate, whatever, but he, they do this. I, I've seen them doing this in the ways in which they have shown. And I think that one particular thing that I would like to stress is uh, something that was present in both presentations, and maybe you can say something more about this. Uh, it's this idea of somehow um, retaining meaning, let's say, or refraining from explanation mm -hmm. or, or kind of um, you, you understand already what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I Today, while I was preparing for this, I saw this little clip that Fernanda did on YouTube that you probably know, of course, in which she, she, call it, she calls it her presentation to become known as an international artist. My presentation. My presentation number one, I think it is. She does those. She does. She, she did, did like five or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And it's like studio visits of her. Give studio visits of her here, yeah, herself in English. In, in English, family. she doesn't speak English. That's <laughs> the, the interesting part. She uses her uh, cell phone to, you know, show us her studio, what she's doing. <laughs> and it's kind of the opposite of what she's trying to do because you don't understand anything. And that's right. the geniality of it, of it, I think. that it's like literally uh, in a format that is, you know, designed to explain the opposite of an explanation. And I think that, that that's something that was also present in what you were saying. <clears throat> specifically in Castile, but not only in Castile, some kind of, uh, you know, really like a, this cunning way of trying to be in institutions to a certain extent, like Castile is doing very, very intelligently. And at the same time, uh, don't give everything to them, like keep things for herself, uh, keep things that are going to be, uh, you know, that they are not going to have, things that she's not going to explain how they work, and I think like, this is like maybe we can say it's not just a grand political gesture, but it is because there's there's a lot of power I think involved in that in that idea of you are not going to understand me or I'm not interested in you understanding me, right? Well, that, that makes me think, you know, of um, uh, isn't <clears throat> it uh, Edward Lisson that he uh, writes about the concept of opacity and opacity and a kind of refusal to being fully under, understood mm -hmm. and to withholding like yourself. Um, I think it, it, in me perhaps addressing that in relation to Fernanda, it was really important to, you know, not kind of make the work legible via a kind of like Western canon, but really to contextualize the work on the terms of the work regardless of whether or not that is legible for an audience. Uh, and I think that that maybe brings up this like question of you're making sense in the way that the work makes sense of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think that that part of the presentation was really, really interesting. And especially, of course, as you said, but this would go to Castillo as well, probably, uh, with an artist like Fernando Laguna that has for years working in those spaces and has a sense of space and has a sense of how to observe things uh, and then uh, maybe it's not the same with other artists but in this case you were able to work with her in the you know how you imagine that this exhibition mm -hmm. right like a co-curating experience to a certain extent I yeah guess. yeah and it was i mean it was a uh, it was very clear that like I had my jurisdiction and she had hers and she knew to trust me that I would, you know, do my, you know, so I, I think that in that way that was productive, like the fact that, yeah, I don't know that this was like relevant to their conversation, but in the relationship that you build with a person when you're working, I think that with Bernardo and the artist with whom he works, there's also a, like a sense of a trust, you know, and the trust that, that as the translator as a person tasked with making the word legible that you will be uh, 
kind of account accountable to the to the work. Uh, but I don't know if that answers any questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good question as well. Mm -hmm. Sally? Uh, following up on this, okay, I think it would think be a great, great, great presentation. Uh, Rosario, I was thinking about the Fernanda Laguna exhibition. I, I wasn't here, I said, couldn't see it. Uh, but I, just following up on what you just said, I'm, I keep thinking because the sequence is so interesting, no? Uh, um, uh, Rojas, and then uh, Vegeta y Felicidad, and then the drawing center. Yeah. <laughs> no, that sequence, well, I, I, I was thinking, you know, in each of these previous instances, the Rojas, it was a creation of a public. So, and, and there is something in the work of Fernanda that creates a public that doesn't necessarily exist. So, or create at least interpolation to, in, at intersections that are not necessarily there previously, and that is part of her power, right? Uh, and then they have work in Villa Fiorito, no? In, 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 um, and I wonder how how did you how did you uh, uh, evaluate or uh, what's your conclusion about your experience at the drawing center in in the sense of the type of interpolation that her work creates and how that circulates and how that interface with you know the public. Uh, you mean and, and, I, and I wonder uh, I wonder if the, an institution such as the drawing center, which is a, a medium, it is a very interesting it's a medium institution, right? It's not the MoMA, it's not the big museum. Can have some flexibility to circulate and to sort of uh, um, push those interpolations in ways that are, can be created. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I guess I, <clears throat> I'm wondering if like what you're asking just to simplify mm -hmm. is like how, how did like an audience mm -hmm. in a kind of New York context mm -hmm. engage or I what mean, does in that- In the case of the, the drawing center, the, the type of Circulation of the drawing center, the type of institution that is the drawing center. I wonder if you have any, you know, if there is any after evaluation the, after, you know, after the experience. I guess something that I've been thinking about is like the sort of um, the kind of inevitability in a way, and in Fernanda's work of like the work to become institutionalized, and what happens when like materials or practices or experiences that are so not meant. Mm -hmm. For that context, it's like does that, but you know, it, it's like it's like the visual, like you know, like the visual, it's like what happens when you you wear it, it's like visual that it, and 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 that kind of a, there's sort of like the the traces or the leftovers from from those experiences mm -hmm. are institutionalized, and how does that uh, mm -hmm. affect the work, you know, posthumously? I mean, I think. And I don't know about again if I'm answering your question, but uh, I think that for better or worse, uh, the landscape in in New York has changed significantly, mm -hmm. precisely for all of the things that we've been discussing today. And I think that uh, the kind of readiness of an audience to engage with, you know, a, a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and a different kind of a mm -hmm. cosmovision of what even is an artistic practice is that also really right. changed. So uh, this exhibition actually was like postponed twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the postponement was really productive for the work because the kind of like the tone uh, in, in the kind of institutional landscape also really changed. Um, and it also gave me a kind of proximity to the work, which is the paradox of the work that we do as curators. We're not, uh, you know, academics work like mm -hmm. you, like working in institutions like universities. We work, you know, oftentimes, you know, as kind of negotiators who are managing, you know, with like different structures of power and uh, kind of representing this, but also contesting and, and finding our fitting, finding a way to fit in between. There's never enough time to also like do research, uh, and, and but but we're still kind of have to sort of like have this super assertive institutional uh, authoritative voice, even though we're you know uh, I don't know at 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 best kind of like really really that, and I think that it, this exhibition at least it gave me a closeness to the material that that I think helped me understand what the show needed. And and the other thing was, for instance, this exhibition was uh, held, like it was uh, like on the back gallery of, his, of the museum mm -hmm. and downstairs, which I always thought that it was really necessary because in, in the vision, you know, in the kind of framework that I had, 
because uh, really I had to justify why it wasn't the drawing center and this question of paper became like kind of like a kind of an agency that I had. Uh, and I, I, I and there were there were people who asked like, oh, why you know the Latin American, South American artist is in the back, you know, and downstairs. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know that the show would have like the potency that I hoped it had in the other space because mm -hmm. it's like it needed a kind of in that internet mm -hmm. so yeah so far yeah <clears throat> i think I, I i can kind of redirect this question here as well in a sense because part of what maybe he was also pointing to is the fact that for instance a lot of fernando laguna's works were exhibited in the city the and other places with people, I don't know, sitting on the floor, drinking beer, there was a concert, you know, it, it was like a type of reception that has nothing to do with the very cold, well, all the cliches here, very white, uh, blah, 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 museum here. So what happens there is part of maybe what you were curious about in terms of how this other type of reception that is much more um, contained, I would say one of the things that it is usually here. So I would say I would ask the same thing to you, like knowing, for instance, in the specific case of Castile, for instance, that you know her very well, and and how do you think it changes the way it's received in a place like the ones it's been exhibited here, like the Hess Museum or uh, Mendes Wood or whatever, and the type of reception, the type of audience interaction it would have in, in when she's exhibited in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was speaking more uh, in general person than about Kasha specifically. Um, I think that, you know, most of the time people talk about curating as um, making relations between works in a certain space, but it's really making relations between works, the space, and people, right? There. So we're, so I'm always thinking about how people are going to be there, especially how can we create collective experiences in this space. Uh, so I'm constantly thinking about the audience, uh, but they are surprises. For me, at least, they are surprises in in in, in very good um, in very good ways because they're just there. They have, they appear in this <laughs> they surprise and that's fascinating. Uh, in the case of Cashel at the Hassel Museum, which is like of state New York, we both have been to <laughs> We live there. Um, also, it's like a 2,000 people village in the state of New York. So it's not New York. It's extra wide and extra conservative, plus um, students, um, cool young students. Um, I, 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 I had a lot of expectations. And I, I, as I was, uh, I was telling you, I would find people meditating inside of the world. Or literally crying inside of the work. I didn't expect that. I expect that people would like relate to the work in a more like, you know, I don't know. I didn't cry. I did a mad thing during the work, and I and I know a, a, a lot a lot about it. So um, there's that. Her, her work was able to to trigger this kind of um, experiences there, which was very fascinating. In New York, I don't know. I wasn't in men's wood every day for um, the show. And I think the work there was very framed to, uh, you know, market market perspectives, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, but it was a sort of a powerful um, uh, show. But you also you also saw in in Israel how people reacted to to your work here. It's very different from from Brazil because in Brazil people understand kind of what is going on left and some of. Um, you know the meanings and processes that are um, embedded in the, in the work that are embedded in. Uh, so maybe in Brazil, people are not in general, but some people are more used to situations in which they have or they cannot have full access to knowledge or information about the world. Because that's how it is in common black, like. If you're like your entire life is a process of initiation with different cycles, and in each one of them you discover things that you could not know before. And you know that you cannot know, so you don't look for it. You know that this knowledge will not be shared with you if you're not initiated, if you're not 
initiated for seven years, for, for 14 years, for 21 years. So these kind of dynamics that is a little bit more common in, in Brazil, even if not like completely general, mm -hmm. um, is completely different than it's here, like Rosario, my, my uh, agree with me, I guess, what would happen if you're giving a guided tour and you tell the person, this you cannot understand, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, it's not gonna be a, um, a successful guided tour. Um, but this clash of systems interests me. Mm -hmm. This interests me to see what happens when they are uh, they have to create a situation in which they are not going to understand. But you know, like talking specifically about Castiel, and and he mentioned just that because we we did curate the show together, and this is why from then on he has the audacity of calling me the curator as well, <laughs> uh, a title that I will not accept. And then uh, at one point we were doing this um, uh, guided tours, but he was not there and I was by myself. So at one point I was in front of Castiel's work, which I don't understand myself, or I only understand some of the things that I discussed with her or with Ronaldo. Uh, so there was this group and they were like, and this, and this, because there are a lot of different signs. And I was literally telling them, I don't know, <laughs> you won't know why that, which I think is also something that maybe we, we, we have to learn to, to, to do as well and to say and to defend that I don't know, even from the position of a curator yeah. in connection to what you were saying precisely. Yeah, I don't know. I cannot know. I, exactly. I cannot know. And let's do that. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions or comments? Because I do have a, a couple of things, but I, I would like to hear from you and Seth. Yeah, I was just wondering. <laughs> thank you so much. Really interesting talks. I love hearing about curation um, and, and you know the, the practice of curation. And there's almost a, a little bit of a tension in terms of gender sexuality and the kind of classifications that that get demarcated on the body. And the desire of this this one artist to not be classified, right? So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own work um, and, and your project as well, right? Because there's there's a translation of the types of bodies and desires that are represented in artworks that you're trying to sort of bring forward as you're producing those different relationalities between the artworks amongst spectators and the art themselves. So yeah, just thinking about that issues around the classifiable and unclassifiable nature of bodies and desires and how that plays itself out in terms of curation as translation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't I I can I can go there. Unless you're no, 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 no. um that's that's very interesting. Maybe I could speak more directly about the case of Castiel because it's a uh, probably the most complicated case that yeah. I uh, faced because um, what is brilliant is that what is brilliant is that she is saying she's not refusing the care boys she is saying the effects of the existence of the care boys uh, is real but the care boys are arbitrary so She's not refusing the care boys to say it's not the care boys are not important. She's saying they are absolutely important, but they are arbitrary, and we have to face the consequences of how they organize the world. So at the same time that, that she that she's saying, um, I refuse to be part of the black race. Um I how can I be very dark, very black, and which is the part of, of the black race. She's not, she's saying, uh, she's organizing um, workshops just for people who are racialized. And then she's not going to say for black people, she's going to say people who are racialized. Um, or um, at the same time, that she's going to uh, talk about the very real consequences of uh, transphobia. She, um, or about or about the, the very arbitrary system that is the, the gender system, she's gonna say, I am binary. So she says things that like make people really confused. Like, how can you say that the genders don't don't exist or that they are arbitrary? And then after everything you say, I am binary. And you're like, oh my God, Cassia, what are you doing? You know? 
So I, uh, what is for me what is fascinating to work with her is really to observe how she creates contradictions and learn from that. And learn from that. Um, and and in her case, I really had to be very attentive because she's very sensitive and strong. Um, and as there are so many details, I had to really learn the whole ethics of how she works so I could represent her work in the institution, like in the first publication about her book that uh, about her work that, that we did, the first website, the first so many things. We had to I had to learn to be able to represent or to present her work with an ethics that was um, for even to uh, um, um, no, I was I was just thinking that I think that in Fernanda's case, who's uh, very openly as a queer artist and writer, like the sort of like the queer sort of like uh, romantic stories are much more present, I think, in her in her literary work. But I remember I think I read an expert excerpt of something that she answers a uh, crisscrossing interview relationship to like why she makes her work and like she says like yeah I make this work so that teen teenagers and lesbians will like send me emoji hearts on Instagram uh, and even like when she asks like you know when did you decide to become an artist and she says well I decided to become an artist after I left like the oppressive kind of a like religious school I went to and I wanted to become a hippie so it's like <clears throat> very disarming you know like the way in which she kind of Circumvents. Yeah, so she would answer that that she went to art school and she became an artist and to kind of like abandon that sort of yeah oppressive institution. Yeah. But yeah. Yes, like yeah, thank you so much. I was just curious about um yeah, I mean related to this question of sort of categories and how you sort of curate. Um, and really back to the point that you made about sort of the turn towards sort of global modernisms or kind of Weevil modernisms or multiple modernisms that are very sort of in vogue. Um, the kind of, I mean, traditionally, the way that that kind of um, shift towards inclusion um, has happened have been sort of on a national register, right? So you'll have like exhibition sort of centered around a specific national context, right? And their kind of translation of modernism, say. Um, but lately, I, I sense, and maybe you have your disagree with this. There's a kind of desire to kind of overcome um, the kind of limitations of a kind of national framework um, for kind of art historical narratives and for curatorial practice. And there's a turn towards kind of global south um, sort of oriented um, exhibitions where there's a kind of focus on sort of south south kind of connections and um, translations and kind of cultural exchange. And there's also been a turn towards like the hemispheric as well. Um, so in one example, recently, a couple of summers ago, I don't know if you were in town, but the Vida Americana um, exhibition at the Whitney, which was about the Mexican muralist that was specifically about, you know, how various, how they kind of were critical to the development of some kind of, um, you know, kind of spirit tradition, but also specifically kind of U.S. modernism with figures like uh, Jackson Pollock and other sort of abstract expressions who, you know, Jackson Pollock, took the paint flicking from some kind of workshop that he did with Sukeva, I think. Um, and also, you know, just talking about the monumental scale of the mural being something that was um, very influential to a certain kind of very famous canonical American painting um, vocabulary. Um, so I was just curious if you think, you know, because you work with artists and you, and you try to, I think, give space to artists who are interested in kind of undoing categories or questioning categories or sort of um, challenging um, our capacity to categorize them. If you think there's any kind of utility in some of these kind of new um, curatorial logics that are um, moved sort of beyond the national, that are transnational, that are looking towards, you know, the hemispheric as a kind of, um, I don't know if we call it a rubric or a kind of um, foundation for building um, a curatorial practice, or if you think it's just yet another set of kind of categories that will be doomed um, to kind of run up against their own limitations in the long run. Mm. <laughs> you go? You I do what I really want. <laughs> they want me to go first. Go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, That's a gentleman. <laughs> uh, 
So I think <laughs> it's uh, I'm obviously super pro new care boys. Um, now it doesn't matter that I'm in favor of every single new care boy <laughs> that is created out there, and also not in favor to how they are used. Um, care boys are goods, right? Uh, the problem uh, here is not only um, the existing care boys, which is a, already a problem, uh, and the repetition of them, and even modern or modernism, I care more is that maybe we should think about how to tell that story without those words. How would we? I don't know. Uh, but also how the categories are uh, used as a theoretical conceptual tool. Um, the problem with, with the, the categories that, as they are used here is that they are tools of measurement and definition um, and sometimes unification. And especially here, unifi uh, unification, maybe that's the word for it, I don't know. Um, but when, it's, when we say Brazil, Latin America, uh, the hemisphere, how can, we, how can you say one single thing that is going to be valid for the whole hemisphere or for the whole Latin America or for the whole uh, Brazil? Um, so when we're talking about creating new contradictions to these care boards is just to precisely to question the meaning of those um, of, of those care boards and how we can expand the horizon and make the, the, the thought more complex about single, about these uh, these care boards. But I uh, but creating new care boards for me is one of the most interesting um, challenges. Like new words, new uh, ways of putting putting words together, you know, uh, but not easy. I mean, maybe here, like, can uh, we can <clears throat> talk a little about this because a good example of what you were kind of asking is the the last documenta, mm. uh, in the sense of like uh, the the main concept and the main mm. frame framing a framework again came from this group in Indonesia. Mm. And there were a lot of South-South conversation, mostly, yeah. I would say, right? And I think, I mean, I guess what I'm thinking is to sort of, and, and this is, I'm rehearsing old ideas, but the kind of shared, you know, exhaustion across the board with a kind of like modernist, like, project. So I do think that there's a kind of like a real need to like reclaim this like categories and like usurp them from being once again assimilated into uh yeah yeah that, that kind of like hege you know like like by hegemony you know and mm -hmm. and I think that maybe I mean is it maybe it's too uh uh like um I don't know arrogant to say that maybe but that but maybe that's like one of the kind of like one of our agencies in being sort of I think that a curator has an incredible amount of agency in the in 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 as much we have a certain degree of power in in deciding like who gets written into like a history and I think that there's potential to kind of reclaim that space to reclaim this uh, broader kind of like concepts that can kind of like unify things but to like you know not allow them to like once again become as assimilated and I think that um I mean, to me, documenta is really signaling like a really major, major tipping point. And I think that we're not even aware, but I do think that uh, like there's going to be like ramifications to that. It's like, I remember when I went to documenta, it was like, like postered all over the city, like Lubo will continue somewhere else. Um, and I actually, to what Bernardo was saying earlier about this kind of necessity of envisioning and imagining like what the institutions of the future are. I mean, I do really think that in a way it's like, it's sort of like there's no real like art world outside of the parameters of what we know. So it's like very utopian, but at the same time, I do think that um, these bigger global like systems are not gonna change and we cannot change them. And I don't know that they should change, but there should be a space for like other, other other types of 
encounters and ways of approximate art and have experiences like what Documento was, which I think was so radical and so transformative. And, uh, you know, you were saying also earlier, like it's so rare to go to like an institution and see a show and be moved. And uh, I was so profoundly moved in like seeing like a kind of like middle class, like German city so transformed and kind of like completely taken over by this incredible like global <laughs> south energy and it was so disrupting and so disarming and it kind of like went to the heart of the art world establishment and now you know Jason Farag was writing we don't know if it's gonna ever happen again like I mean the kind of like the puncture the kind of like stabbing has been I think like really uh, like real um and I think that that's signaling kind of like a shit like a split in a way and maybe that split is like we need that split it's like okay there's like the kind of establishment art world and then there's room for like other yeah other pocket art yeah I think this is a beautiful thought to end the conversation on because it's like this idea that you brought like in your presentations of these two maneuvers, let's say, that you are doing and that we can do, that are, one of them is working within the institution that you are doing very well, uh, and, and see I mean, what kind of things we can do, what kind of things we cannot do within these institutions, our institution. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing is that also uh, Leonardo was pointing to, and you just mentioned, and of course he also does, because he says he's the director of the Sola Dos do Alacaxis and Rio de Janeiro. It's like how we can imagine different institutions, different spaces, with other logic uh, and other utopian possibilities. I mean, Pesce Felicidad was also that, right? A different, mm -hmm. like uh, it was not, it was an art gallery with 20 inverted commas. So maybe it, part of the task is also that one. So thanks a lot to both of us. It was a pleasure and thank you for being here, everybody.